Hello everyone, you have made it to chapter 9, A Boy Lost in Darkness. I really hope your Christmas went well and please enjoy this next chapter. Disclaimer, this content is rated R18+. Plus. There may be cursing, blood, gore, and sexual content. This content is for entertainment purposes only. All rights of this product belong to the original owner of the work, Wana AM. Copyright all work for... In this video from our audio written book belongs to the original writer, artist, Wayana A.M. This video is for entertainment purposes only. To contact the original artist for use of products shown or heard in this video, contact at YouTube channel Wham Times 3 blog, Instagram Wham Times 3, Twitter at MX3 under dash WA, Facebook page Wham Times 3. The program used to edit this video was Adobe Premiere Elements 2020. I say Zalman Lito, who was still distant in thought. Reggie, who as usual sat talking to his teddy bear about what happened to Kelly, bringing him up to date of course, and Ayato, who stared at his trip at Brad Lito, sat in the smoking room. So what was that about? asked Ayato impatiently, finally turning to Ayase, who should have had all the answers. It seems the little druid's powers are starting to grow and are finally awakening, stayed Ayase deep in thought. But there also seems to be something else. Something I didn't quite expect. You being surprised about something, I say? I thought that was impossible, said Zelman teasingly, but with respect. Ayato humped and turned back to his brother Lito. Even I can be surprised at times, Zelman. But this has to do with your own son. I say glanced at Lito. Of course, you should have noticed it the first time you met the girl. Zelman looked confused. Reggie turned to Teddy to watch the conversation and rested his head on the Teddy's head. I knew the triplets and the girl were connected, but not how. She is connected to all of them, but only she and Lito share a specific kind of connection. Lito finally looked up at Ayase, being greeted by those black depths. Ayato grumbled something under his breath. Lito was shaken. He was pale. Even for a creature of the night, his green eyes searched Ayase's for answers. You mean she's my life mate, he said quietly. You have to be joking, Ayato snapped. Lito felt empty. He still couldn't believe it. He was cursed, damned from the day he was born, yet here she was, dropping into his lap. Haven't you felt it? Ayase shot back. Damn them, grumbled Ayato, telepathically. Remembering Ayase never truly punished them when they broke one of the rules, but simply shot back questions to theirs until they finally answered their own questions. Actually, it was the worst kind of punishment when you got down to it. Lito sighed and stared back at the fire. True, he'd felt drawn to Kali the moment they met, but after his brothers came into the picture, he simply brushed it off as her unique blood. Except, when she rejected his touch, it stung. No, it burned deep inside him. His heart and soul, if it had anything to speak of, were hurt and pain. They wanted the touch and feel Kelly to make sure she was okay, that she was alive. But whatever had, had scared her enough to, oh god, what had scared her wasn't something but someone. Him. He suddenly felt sick, one hand going through his hair, knocking his fedora off balance as he leaned against the mantle. Are you sure she's Lito? stayed Ayato, still grumbling, but he knew it, even more than his own brother. Hmm. This has become interesting, huh, Teddy? Is that why I don't despise her? Positive, Ayase said without hesitation. However, you and your triplet brother, Ayato, are connected to her as well. More than the rest of us. It is, after all, your job to help your brother keep his life mate safe, just as much as it is to do the same for you if you ever find yours. The last time a life mate had come into the clan, it was Karen, and Lito remembered how that had ended. Life mate was similar to the human version of soulmate, but even more complicated, more complex, and more... Lito, I say, dragged him out of his thoughts. You need to fix whatever happened in that vision. The castle spoke to her, and it has never spoken to anyone before. It is your job to ensure her safety and well-being. You can't very well do that with her being distant with you, do you understand? And how exactly is he supposed to do that? How is he supposed to tell her the truth as to why she managed to find her way to us? How she managed, managed to stumble through an unbreakable spell and find the mansion? At the moment, it is more likely not the best thing, and telling anyone outside this room would definitely not be wise either. And with that, I say ended the meeting. Lito rose from his desk. His muscles sore from sitting and filling out paperwork all day. He truly wanted to take his pet, his little pet, out to play, but after that scene of missing for three days, then reappearing out of thin air, swearing like brimstone and scared of him touching her. Despite them being life mates, he kept his distance, though it was killing him. She had grown quiet and distant even after he turned home, it hadn't helped. Ayato left too, not wanting to deal with the girl, and so he and Nick went into the woods for a couple of months. If Lito wasn't the head of the mansion, he would have joined them gladly. All Lito knew was he wanted to be near Kelly, and he couldn't stand keeping his distance. He was shocked by how much it hurt for her to tell him not to touch her. He made his way through the mansion. It was mostly empty. The off-season had come, and the smell of summer on the edge drifted across the mansion. He enjoyed the emptiness, the silence. However, it was too quiet. 
Kali had become a mute. She never said a word, kept her head down. She, she'd closed in on herself. When the school called and asked what her silence and distance was, he was forced to make some kind of excuse for her. He made his way into the kitchen and made two ham sandwiches. He found her in the library asleep in front of her laptop, halfway through notes. It was all she did anymore, even when she went for walks. She just seemed to be somewhere else. Lyta put the plates down and turned off the computer, then proceeded to move the notebooks when he noticed the notes were not the no normal school notes. He looked at them closely, trying to make sense of it. Princess? Me? Puzzle maker? Angela. Must find the puzzle keeper, Pathfinder, the Joker, the Knights, and the Princess? Follow the rabbit down the rabbit hole. Alice in Wonderland. Was this part of her vision, whatever she experienced? When I say had told her she'd been missing for a couple of days, Kelly kept writing in a notebook, insisting she'd only been gone a couple of hours. They weren't sure why her voice wasn't working. She didn't understand either, but she hadn't seemed surprised. He put the notebook down, placing it on the computer, and laid a blanket on Kelly, taking in her scent while she was asleep before forcing himself to leave. If they were life mates, then why would- then why could they not communicate? Why couldn't they interact so it wasn't this bad? Never in his darkest dreams did he ever think he'd be blessed with this. After all, he was a monster, inside and out, with no soul or heart, cursed to live his life in the depths of hell both on earth and in the afterlife. Kai woke to the sound of a piano playing, a sad, lonely sound through the quiet mansion. She sat up and stretched, noting her computer notes put up neatly and the plate wrapped in plastic with a sandwich on it. How long had she been out? She wondered, getting up, grabbing the plate on her way and making her way to the kitchen to grab a soda. She ate half of the sandwich then made her way through the mansion, following that lonely sound, not surprised when she found Lyta playing it. His study sat on the opposite side of his bedroom chamber. It was rounded. The curved walls were covered in books of different kinds of music over centuries, not just years. How old was Lyta, anyway? The others aged differently, after all. His day of birth and death were different. Most prebirds were, not born from this world, was what her mother used to tell her. The castle and the lay on the vision seemed like from the days when knights and kings ruled the world. His eyes were closed, and as the sun rose against his back, the sound only seemed to grow lonelier. Kelly walked in slowly, quietly, like a shy, scared puppy. She again... She didn't get the flash of the vision of him killing his mother. She reacted slightly, thankful that all she saw was Sent Lito and she was drawn to him and his music. He was the boy abandoned and betrayed by his own mother. Sure, he killed her, but he was much like Kelly, an unwanted child, lonely, punished for being unwanted. When all your father wants is a son and all his wives and mistresses give him his, da his daughters, your life becomes hell. Not only for the daughters, but also the mothers. Her thoughts began to trail, returning to those dark times of her early childhood, a childhood that did not exist. But something told her she had had a happy childhood, too, before it was taken from her. Fitting for us to meet here, my little pet. Those words, despite being solemn, held a lot of meaning in them. Yes, she was his, but not in a bad way, right? She stepped towards him quietly and sat down next to him, facing out the window, placing her head on his shoulder. A very intimate position, and not like with her and Aito, where it felt like it was between siblings. Now this was different. Ever since that vision, everything was different. She enjoyed feeling his warmth. Despite what Miss supposedly said about vampires being cold corpses, he was warm, and so were his brothers. Maybe it was a Clark thing after all. His brothers and father was the same, while all the other vampires she met all were icy cold. No, it was just him. This was Lito. Warm, welcome mean in a strange, perverted way, but she liked the feel of the slight movements he made as he played, the way he smiled. Kelly took in the tune he was playing and smiled. Isn't that supposed to be played in a guitar? She asked herself thoughtfully. Lito stopped playing and turned towards her, his eyes filled with a hesitant curiosity, his expression showing shock. She moved her head slowly, looking at him, wondering what was wrong. Then she started to realize why he was looking at her like that. She hadn't spoken, her lips hadn't moved, she was simply thinking to herself. But Lito had heard her. She started to panic, but Lito grabbed her shoulders. Don't you dare, he hissed. If you draw any further away, his voice cracked with emotion. I don't know what I will do. I can't lose you again. Again? What did he mean, lose her again, she wondered. He was trembling, and then the same anguish that filled his eyes back at Ayase's castle returned. She bit her lip, the only thing she could do. His eyes averted to her lips. Before she knew it, he had captured them with his. It was a deep, passionate kiss as his tongue danced with her as her body filled with tingling warmth. She felt his longing, his pain, and his fear. She felt the blood drawn from her lips as he pressed hard enough she could fill his fangs. Her tongue danced over them, filling the sharp, predatory part of him. He smiled against her as they fell onto the sea of the piano. His arms wrapped around her waist as 
Hers wrapped around his shoulders. When he finally released her, both of them were out of breath. His eyes had changed almost like that boy, a loving, innocent, not able to hurt a fly, slowly appeared in his eyes. Lyta brought her to him, holding her so tight she couldn't breathe. You are mine. Don't you ever forget that, he whispered harshly in her ear, his breath teasing her skin. I forbid you to leave. If you do, I will hunt you down myself. Do you understand? Kelly's eyes filled with tears that teased to fall as his fangs sank into her throat. I understand, she thought, her tears falling as she stared up at the ceiling. Mommy? Mommy, are you there? Mommy? The voice was quiet, like a small child. Kelly looked around the empty, dark forest. Mommy? He cried. Hello? Hello? Who is there? Where are you? Kelly looked around the empty forest. It was dark, foggy, and the trees seemed to twist in an unnatural way. And there was no life, just dark emptiness. Are you my mommy? The voice was closer. Where are you? She cried out. You're not my mommy. The voice came from behind her. Kelly spun around to find a small boy, no more than five years old at the most, dressed in torn, dirty clothes. His blonde curls were tangled in an endless nest of rats with leaves and sticks. His blue eyes were drawn gray, empty hollows, his skin deathly pale. Are you my mommy? He asked, but wasn't staring at her as he said it, but through her. No, but I am a friend. She smiled, extending her hand out to the boy. Come, let's go find your mother. The boy rubbed his eyes. A friend? Yes, the boy went to grab her hand, then hesitated. You smell really good. I am really hungry. The boy looked up at her, and instead of a boy, it was a monster. The eyes were completely gone, nothing more but black hollows, and his teeth were now sharp fangs covered in thick white saliva. I will feast until there is nothing left. His voice changed, too, almost like a demon's. The boy lunged at her. Kelly screamed and punched out. She hit something, then she landed on a hard surface. She opened her eyes and found herself staring up at the ceiling. She was on the floor, and her heart was pounding so hard it felt like it would explode. She heard something on the other side of the bed. She jumped and scooted away so she could get a glimpse of what was on the other side of the bed. A white hand sat on her covers. Two angry green eyes stared back at her. She breathed, not remembering holding her breath. Jeez, Pancake, I just wanted something sweet, Ayato grumbled. She felt a light She felt a light throbbing from her shoulder and grabbed it and drew her hand back blood Ito slid over the bed and landed in front of her he pushed her to the floor and sank his fangs into her throat painfully out of one nightmare into another she thought thinking about the boy hey ayato can i ask you a question all she got in response was the slurpy noise of his drinking was there ever a boy with blue eyes and blonde curly hair that got lost in the woods around here he released her and looked at her questionably human he asked she shook her head he sat up and rested on her pelvis his weight keeping her pinned to the wooden floor the fire crackled in response to dying out. The room was pitch black, and Aito's face seemed to almost glow as shadows danced along his pale skin. His skin was bruised and scarred, showing he spent his lifetime outside. His knuckles and hands were covered in calluses. She'd often find him practicing his sword fight in the morning or throwing punches. He was always keeping in shape, much like a fighter, almost like a knight. I cannot answer your question, he stayed. So there was. You're an outsider, he looked at her, his eyes giving her a warning not to press the subject more. Despite being curious, she knew Ayato had the worst temper of the brothers. Can we move to the bed? It's cold and hard down here. He looked at her for a moment, then stood, grabbing her wrist and helping her to a standing position. Before he flung her to the bed, drew the blankets back over her and laid down next to her, holding her in his arms. She knew he slept like this when he was upset about something. Why are you asking about the boy? He said against her hair. Kai bit her lip. No reason, just curious. But then again, according to Gren's fairy tales, Chuan go into the woods and get eaten by the monsters within them all the time. He humped, not being amused. Pancake, you should know by now. We do not eat children. He trailed off. Even when we destroy a whole city, we leave the Chuan alone, no matter how annoying. He pinched her and she squirmed. <laughs> he seemed to be trying to comfort her. She already knew what he stated was true. She had whispered. She had witnessed it firsthand. There are other monsters out there in the world, too, she stayed before snuggling up against him, wanting the comfort of not being blown after that dream. She heard a stay, quiet breathing of sleep. Pancake, said Ayato tiredly and patiently. You need to stop reading those damn horror stories. They keep giving you nightmares. Zaman's mansion was one of the first European buildings built in Japan, and it showed. Much like the Triplets mansion, it was like stepping back in time. The estate was not as large since it was in town when it had been built, and court its courtyards, which were surrounded by a large, thick brick wall enclosed by a black gate, was rather impressive looking. The east the estate was one of the 19th century houses brought over in the Meiji er period over 150 years before. It was a Victorian with Japanese architecture smoothly added. The roof had the rafters and curves of a pagoda, however, the wood wooden and stone walls had the Victorian style. The rectangle windows shimmered out of the three stories of the house, overlooking the lush gardens. The curves of the two end walls, taken from the watchtowers of a castle, had vines dancing up their walls. Wait until you step inside, Petra, and mused Lyta as he watched the girl who was practically glued to the tinted window. Ito Huff, not at all pleased to be visiting his father. 
I glanced over at Lito, searching his eyes for the answer that had not been answered. Why did they leave for Japan right at the start of summer vacation? She had pressed him countless times, but Lito simply stated he wanted to get away for a while. Though she knew that wasn't the full truth, something nagged at her that there was more to the story. A servant opened the door. Lito stepped out first, then offered his hand to Kelly, who took it, still looking at the mansion and gardens at all, though he knew she was also trying to figure out why they were even there. The inside of the mansion was, was similar to the outside, a mix of Japanese and Western architecture white walls which slid open to show grand rooms of different types. They walked into the dining room, a servant leading the way where a grand feast awaited them. The master says, please enjoy. He will join shortly, said the servant before leaving. They ate their fill, but someone did not appear until long after to inform them of the meeting time before leaving again. I really don't feel like showing up, but I don't want, I don't want to give my client a bad rep, insisted Lito as he slipped on his white button-up shirt. Kelly sat at the edge of the bed, watching him, still trying to feed the pieces to go. They were there for some kind of meeting that much she had figured out, seeing others showing up soon after Zelman's announcement. Lito being the only remaining of the three years for his mother's clan, he had to go as a representative of the Butagi clan, while Zelman was showing up as a Korkin, both there for the coven. There there were others too, and Mr. Kane, who was one of the oldest werewolves, was showing along with a sage named Say, and some humans representing the shadow hunters and angels in representation of the archangels of the throne, both of which were well known to be hunters of the others for centuries, but in out honor of peace among humans and others, they showed as representation of the human race, supposedly. She felt Lito's uneasiness and was wondering if that was the cause of her being dragged along when normally she was left behind when Lito would go to such meetings. Aito was even going to this meeting. He normally would take over his brother's position as second in command and take care of the mansion. Second born, second in command, she guessed. But then again, Aito was the oldest of the triplets, so why wasn't he in charge of the estate and Lito taking the role of second born, since technically he was? However, she had a strange feeling that despite Aito being the oldest of the triplets, he didn't really want the responsibility that came with it. Lito burned up his white long sleeved it drip dress shirt, but left the collar slightly undone so you could get a glimpse of his chest. He finished off the look by pulling on his black dress jacket and famous fedora. Of course, I'd rather be spending the day in bed with you, my little pet. He winked. Was he taking advantage of her not having a say about coming? Of course, when you only talk at the most inconvenient of times, you don't really get a say. She'd rather have stayed with Nick on the estate, but he told her you're Lito's. You should be a good pet and follow your master's wishes. She sighed, resting her head in her hands and stared at the floor. Lito sat down next to her on the bed, slipping on his shoes and tying them, humming as he did so. He turned to her then and she flinched at the look in his eyes possessive, dark, and hungry. They danced along her skin as he seemed to debate something. Are you sure you won't be all right on your own, my little pet? His eyes flashed look into hers with concern. She shrugged. You mean to order you anything before I go? She shook her head. He sighed. I would wish you'd talk to me more often. He nearly growled that last part. Guess it can't be helped. He stood. I still don't like leaving you alone, but you should be safe here. My father doesn't let just anyone into his house. He kissed her forehead before leaving. The fill of his lips on her flesh lingered long after he'd left. Mommy! Mommy, where are you? Kali sat up and looked around the empty room. The mansion was mostly empty. Everyone in poor at the meeting and everyone else either asleep or doing what they did during the day. There was not a sound from outside the door, had she imagined that. Mommy? Mommy, are you there? Mommy, she couldn't just stay cooped up in the room all day. She stayed to herself as she walked through the mansion. She never heard the boy when she awoke. She was awake, wasn't she? She finished this off. Ow. Yep, definitely awake. Mommy, are you there, Mommy? The young boy's voice echoed through her mind as she made her way into the back of the mansion. Kelly was drawn to it. He was calling up to her. Mommy, Mommy. He sounded scared, just like he had been in the had been in that forest. She walked down a long, dark, empty hallway into a large door. The presence was behind the door. She wondered, grabbing the handle. What do you think you're doing? said a harsh voice from behind her. Kelly jumped and slowly turned, find herself looking at Zelman's second command, Zeus, a half-breed vampire who'd somehow made his way up the ladder. She didn't really like him that much, just something about him she considered as he glared at her with his red eyes. He hated that he was not allowed to touch her, it was obvious. It didn't help that Lyta always liked to point out that her blood was the sweetest and rarest of bloods he'd ever had. You're not supposed to leave the chamber, he cried. Mommy? Mommy, are you there, Mommy? That voice again. She glanced at Zeus, who showed no indication that he'd heard anything. Go back now, he commanded with warning. Lyta walked into the room, exhausted and obviously irritated. Kelly was sitting on the bed, watching a movie, but didn't seem to be paying much attention. That voice of the little boy kept calling out to her, but she didn't want to deal with Zeus again. She was starting to gain a huge migraine as well. I'm home, Petchan. Did you miss me? He teased, flopping down next to her, brushing her hip with his fingers. Kelly glanced at him, then went back to look at the movie. 
Are you hungry? She shook her head. Are you tired? She shrugged. Not being able to talk or curse, more importantly, was becoming a big pain in the ass, she concluded. Is something wrong? She sighed and grabbed a paper and pen, which sadly was the only way she could communicate with anyone except telepathically with Lito. Where was that? She cried. Zeus is a dick, she wrote on it. Ah, I see you left the room then. Was I not supposed to? No, I'm not saying that. He's probably going to brush it off as uh, I was protecting her sort of thing, he shrugged. But more importantly, he pushed her down onto the bed. I want to see how much he missed me. He licked her neck before sinking his fangs slowly into her flesh and drawing the trembling she produced as he drank deeply. The tension in his body relaxed as he mounted into the curve of her. She held him close, the voice seeming to finally quiet down. She closed her eyes and enjoyed the quiet darkness that took her over as Lito drank from her. She felt his arms wrapping around her, his cool warmth surrounding her. Then his hand slid under her shirt as he pinched her nipple. She whimpered as he pushed her skirt up and pulled down her underwear, quickly disposing them before he thrust deep inside her. She gasped at the sudden contract, but he didn't give her a chance to adjust as he pounded it in her at an inhuman rate. Shit, he cursed as he grabbed her thighs and held her, still lifting her up as he rose onto his knees and pounded it into her. Sorry, Petra, I can't, he groaned as he released deep inside her and collapsed on top, still gently rocking inside. She wrapped her arms around him and stroked his red waves as he caught his breath. Kelly walked through the dark, empty forest. The trees were burned this time, contouring in pain. Fear did not fill the forest, but pain, sadness, the feeling of loss. Losing someone so precious it was unbearable. She knew that pain, the pain of her own mother's death, still fresh in her memory. As she walked, she found bodies, hundreds of bodies, scattered through the forest, all burned to a black crisp, much like the trees themselves. The ruins of her castle set before her, and in the center of it was the boy covered in blood. They hurt mommy. She stopped a few feet away from the boy and looked at the dead bodies, or at least what was left of them. They had to pay. They all had to pay, he trod off. Who hurt your mother? They did. They said we were our family, but they hurt mommy. Who is they? My brothers. Kelly stepped back as the boy changed into a monster. And you, he charged for her as she screamed and fell back, but kept falling. When she hit the ground, the scene had changed and they stood in front of a castle. The blonde woman from before laid on the ground, her heart torn out of her chest, and Luca, a teenage Aunt Luca, stood above her, eating her heart. The sounds of a baby crying, but then Kelly realized they weren't the cries of a baby, but the boys. She turned it, looking at the boy. She reached for a moin to comfort him. Petchen? Lito's voice came from nowhere, but he was close, she could was sure. Petchen, wake up. Come here, my little pet. His voice was worried, concerned. I have to help him. He needs me. It's just a dream. Wake up. The ground started to shake and crumble under her feet. No, he needs me, she said, trying to get up and go to the boy who was fading further and further away as she sank into the ground. Kelly, wake up. Come back to me. His breath brushed her ear, her cheeks. She felt him kissing her, her forehead, her cheeks, her lips. Kelly jolted awake in a gasp. Lito sat above her, his green eyes capturing her purple ones and she froze. It's okay, it was just a dream. It was not real. She slowly sat up and Lito let her, but did not move from hovering over her. His hands on either side of her hips and his eyes never left her face as she rubbed her arms and looked around, remembering where she was. Here, he handed her a glass of water. She took it in her shaking hands and took a couple of sips. She kept looking around. Is it too dark? She shook her head. She had to ask. She had to force herself to see it. She had to look beyond that demon into the young man who sat before her. No, not a man. A pure blood vampire who had taken her in, who had protected her from the wolf wind and hid her. She wasn't sure how, but she knew she was safe with him. Her hand reached out and her fingers pressed against his lips. His lips kissed her fingers gently and lightning flashed through her body, reacting to him and only him. Why was that? Then she heard the boy. No, felt the boy calling to her. It was growing too great. Lou. She tried. Her voice kept it stuttering. <clears throat> Lito watched her patiently, waiting eager, even. He needed this, too. He needed her to talk to him as much as she needed to talk to him. She took a deep breath and then tried again. But what happened to Eve? She managed through stutters. He drew a little distant. Did, did Lu Luca... Lito looked away and nodded. Luca killed Eve. He tried blaming me on my mother, but he was the one who ripped out her heart in the end. Do you have a baby brother? Besides Reggie? She nodded. Yes. Eve had one more son before everything happened and this angered my... That woman who attacked her out of jealousy. Luca took advantage of it. Kelly brought her knees up to her chest. What happened to the boy? Lito didn't answer. He just looked off into space, growing distant. He went wild. Came vo Zalman's voice, sadness and regret in the tone. He entered the room slowly. We had to capture him. However, we could not bring ourselves to kill him. Where is he? No stutter. Yay. She mentally patted herself on the back. Pat Chun enough. Go back to sleep. Lito stood and left the room. Someone looked up back at her. The nursery, but it would not be wise to go near him. He warned before leaving as well. Someone found his son on a balcony, looking up at the empty night sky. Why does it worry you, my son? Lito looked down. Her memories are returning.
Yes, and with their return, so were the, her memories of the betrayal, the loss. Naito grabbed the ledge and squeezed. The stone creaked under his touch. She will begin to question why I did not search for her. The stone cracked. Zaman placed a gentle hand on his son's shoulder. She will also remember your love, Naito looked up at Zaman. She will remember a childish promise, Laito snapped. She will remember her prince charming. Zoman left his son. Kelly stood in front of the door. She put her hand on the door handle, then quickly glanced around before she opened it and walked in. She was greeted by a dark and dusty nursing room. A baby crib sat on one side, toys laid out along the floor, and in a dark corner was a cage. The figure was in the cage, and as she approached it slowly, she was greeted by an inhuman growl that chilled her spine. The boy was blonde, his hair long and matted from not being taken care of. His eyes were an ocean blue, changing colors much like the waves themselves. His pale skin was bruised and dressed in dry blood. The smell of death and unwashed body filled the air, but he seemed more like a wild animal than a young boy of perhaps four or maybe five years old, she concluded as he growled and hissed at her his eyes going a blood red color. He ran into the cage a couple of times, even tried clawing at her with his long nails that were more claws than fingers. She sat calmly, watching him curiously as he paced in the small cage on all fours like a wild trapped jungle cat. Maita reminded her of a cat too, especially with the green eyes that seemed to blaze into your very soul before he fed. She thought about what Zaman said about how the boy had gone wild. His own mother was killed in front of him by Luca, his older brother. The boy had gone on a killing spree, leaving them no choice but to kill him. But unable to, they locked him in a cage. She saw what was left of those plastic bags humans put blood in, laying in the bottom of the cage. She could, sm she could also smell the urine and filth. How could she get through to this boy, a lonely child who witnessed his mother's death? She thought back to her own mother's death, how she tried to warn everyone, only to be left alone in this world. She shook a breath, taking the memories and the tears that tried to fall and buried them deep within herself. I understand how you feel, the boy growled and snarled. She shifted so she could rest one hand on her knee. My mother was killed in front of my eyes by the very people who I had called family my whole life. The boy stopped briefly and seemed to listen. It hurts to lose someone, but it's even worse when that person that took the loved one away from you is someone who you trusted. He was family that you loved. You want to run and hide, even lash out at anyone who approaches you. The boy sat down like a little puppy and listened, his head leaning to one side. Laito appeared in the ajar doorway and stilled, watching curiously. My mother was gentle, patient, and she always smelled like peppermint. She smiled sorrowfully at the memory. She read stories, mostly Grimm's fairy tales, because they were closer to the real world than fantasy. I think it's like ironic I live with vampires now. And if I had a nightmare, she would sing to me until I fell asleep. When I got sick, she wouldn't leave my side. Was your mother like that? Did she sing to you? Did she read? The boy copied her position and thought quietly. Silence filled the air between them, but it was a thoughtful, peaceful silence. Laito watched as Laito stepped out. Laito put his fingers to his lips and continued to watch. My mother smelled like vanilla. The boy's voice was quiet, hoarse even, but Kelly looked up. He seemed like a normal boy except he was still in a cage and still needed a bath badly. She was quiet except when getting at Edgar about not behaving and acting like an heir to the throne. Was that why Edgar was so entitled? She used to set chimes up by my ribs, so when the wind would blow, they'd tinkle like little fairies. Her voice was like the chimes, not quite like Lady Angelus, but she had a gentle fierceness of her own. I think you'd like her. She was very pretty, too. Blonde, blue eyes, tall, slender. She kept her hair up in a bun, braided bun, and she liked the color blue. Would you like to go visit your mother? I don't want to say something, but like to put his hand on his brother's mouth, he glared at him. We can visit her shrine? The boy smiled and lined up. Yep. But first, you have to make me a pinky promise. A pinky promise? The boy questioned. Yep. It's a promise you make with your pinky that can never be broken. Kelly wagged her pinky finger at the boy. Ah, okay, what do I have to promise? You have to promise me that when I let you out of this cage, you stay a little boy. Do you think you could do that? The boy thought about this really thoroughly, then he looked up at Kelly and her extended pinky finger. Can you promise me something too? Sure, anything. That I hopefully won't regret, she finished not out loud. Can you become my big sister? Kelly was taken aback. You remind me a lot of my big sister, Angela. She was much like you. I am sure she won't mind. The boy sm smiled brightly. Kelly hesitated. All right, but I will not replace her. Deal? Deal. The boy wrapped his finger around hers, and they said promise at the same time. I'm Kotaro. What's your name? Kelly. She smiled as she slowly undid the multiple locks in the cage, breaking the spells as she went. When the door cracked open, she extended her hand out to the boy, who gladly took it. And let's get you cleaned up, and then we can pick up some roses for your mama. Can we visit your mama, too? Maybe someday. You see, my mother isn't here like yours. Oh. Where is your mama? Kelly grew quiet, then said, She has a secret place up in the high mountains. Whoa, really? Wow. I wonder how high the mountain is. He said thoughtfully as Kelly took him into the bathroom connected to the nursery and started a bath. 
She washed him up, using a second bath to make sure he was clean. She placed his hair in a low ponytail. Then they picked out some clothes they found in a drawer in the nursery and made their way to the family cemetery. Aito and Halito closed on their heels. The two picked some roses, white ones, because that was E's favorite color of rose, then made their way to her shrine. The shrine was small but beautiful, done in white marble with angels and roses. A picture set in the middle of an Eve, a portrait of her sitting reading a book. Well, Papa says I looked like her. What do you think? She had to agree, but the eyes were different. More like Edgar's dark, empty depths and Kotro's bright summer ocean blues. There always seemed to be sadness, even loneliness to her. I think you do look a lot like your mother's. Smiled Kelly, handing the roses over to Kotro so he could place them on his mother's shrine. Say, how did your mother look like, sissy? It had been a long time since she thought about her own mother. She had black hair like a raven's and brown eyes with a hint of gold. Her skin was lighter than mine. She had a slim body, too, like a ballerina dancer. Well, she used to be one, that is. Almost joined the German ballet. Wow, really? What happened? Why didn't she? She had me, shrugged Kai. Oh, really? Are you a ballerina, too? No, my body never be. Wanted to be that graceful. Hmm. Maybe you're a singer. I don't know. I never tried. They made their way back to the mansion. Maya watched her mouth wide open. She looked at Laito and Aito, who put their fingers to their lips and continued to watch as Kotaro gave Kelly the grand tour of the mansion. I think you look like your mother. Kelly shook her head. Everyone told me I looked like my father. Hmm. Did your father have black hair? No, brown. Then, I think you look like your mother. Your hair is black, like raven's feathers. There you have it, chapter 9, A Boy Lost in Darkness. I really hope you guys enjoyed and had a wonderful Christmas. And please enjoy this weekend and stay safe. New Year's is coming up next week, which means we're all going to be busy celebrating the coming up year. Me especially, since I have a New Year's baby. So please take care, be safe, and love you, my sweeties.